Welcome back, everybody, to This Is My Bourbon Podcast. I'm Barry, I'm your host, and no, I'm I'm a little tired. You are a... I'm, I'm Whiskey Mutant, by the way. Yeah, there, here's Eric here. I, I mean, you all know who we are. Yeah, <laughs> maybe. Or maybe this is the first time you've ever listened to the show. Either way, this guy, straight up, didn't like... I love when this guy surprises me, because he's a very open he probably talks too much he probably says too much sometimes you more know? more than like i'm very honest he's very honest and he's very yeah. open and all that this dude straight up went full rock star last night <laughs> didn't even text me or anything saying because i mean i know he posted about it but i i didn't see it i was kind of busy when he was going but Dude, I I found out you were rocking all night long <laughs> just by scrolling through a story. <laughs> I was going to bed, and you are at Tin Roof rocking your ass off yeah. for four hours straight. Wait, so I texted you last night asking if you all were home. Yeah. Right? Yeah, I was sitting on the couch about to go to bed. When and you that. It, what's so funny is I almost like, I, I was about to like jokingly s- like send you a picture of the stage and go, y'all should come out and party with us. Uh, you that would have been very tempting. Yeah. Would you have? No. Yeah, see, that's the thing. I had to get up this morning for baseball. No, I know. But I'm so proud of you for getting out there and hurting your body. I'm exhausted. I mean, I okay, so for context here. Um, first of all, thank you all so much for coming back or listening to the show yes. for the first time. It's your first time here. Uh, subscribe to the show. Give us a five star rating review We're if you back. haven't done so already. We're back. Um, Bull swing. We haven't uh, been together in uh, three weeks. We've been together three times in the last <laughs> hour, though. It's been a while. We missed. Yeah. Uh, and we're ready to go again. Yeah. That's so, hit stop. He's always watching us. And yes, he can come too. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. Um, I, uh, <clears throat> I I played a gig uh, with my buddy Drew Crawley, whom I played with in Louisville last year, beginning of last year, uh, for a few gigs. And <clears throat> I hadn't played in Lexington in five or six years. You have. Which is crazy. You have, though. What do you mean? You've played for old people. Well, okay. I don't... Mm. Okay. He has. That's fair. Our gig started at... Well, hold, hold on. We were told that we were booked to play from 10 to 2. 10 p.m. to 2 a.m. Right. Right? Okay. Still too late, but... Still too late. Yeah. Whatever. I'm fine with it. Yeah. Like I've I've played that time slot before. All right. I'm pretty I'm pretty fine with it. Then we get told that we were misbooked and it was actually 10 30 to 2 30. I was like, you know what? I kind of knew that I was gonna not get a whole lot of sleep. Anyway. Um, so, uh, I'm, I'm, Cause I'm, broken. I'm very tired. I didn't leave tin roof, uh, until three 30. Uh, I got home at three 45, fell asleep finally at 4 AM. Uh, and I was awoken by daddy. Uh-oh. Daddy, I want to get in bed and watch TV with you at 9 a.m. What did she want to watch? Barbie. Oh. So I said, okay, fine. Barbie dream house. So, uh, yeah. So 9 a.m. Uh, and I thought, I'll be able to sleep through a little bit of this. No. no. Not a bit. Not a bit. I had. I woke up and I just kind of had to deal with it. I took two 500 milligram Tylenols uh, because my head was screaming and my body ached and 
Now he's recording uh, podcasts. Now I'm recording a you. podcast all about bourbon. This is how dedicated and this man is. Spirit of Kentucky. <laughs> to this community and because, this podcast. Because we appreciate you guys and we love you. And we want to let you know, too, that there's a great way for you to support the show. That's by heading to patreon.com slash my bourbon podcast. For as little as a dollar a month, you can support the show. But if you want to get bonus content that comes out every single week for Five dollars a month, or as little as five dollars a month. Uh, Mondays, Tuesdays, uh, and sometimes later in the week as I mean, well. You get entertainment the first half of your week. We get you through the first half of your work week. Then it's it's basically the end of the week, and you're partying. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. Monday you get a bonus episode. Right. Tuesday Another you get the pregame, pre-game chats. Thing. You could also listen to the uncut version of the podcast. Or as well on listen, Tuesdays. Or you can wait till Wednesday. Or you can wait till Wednesday and you get the edited version of the podcast. Uh-huh. Thursday, I go live. Yes. Right? Sometimes on Fridays, there's videos yeah. on YouTube. So I got you covered. And we you got see you us covered. on Instagram? We're all over the place. You oh, got well. 69 with the Whiskey Mutant. Yeah, you got some reels. We got for reels. The show. Yeah, I mean, it's what do you want? We're keeping you hard. <laughs> <laughs> you weren't able to make it through that sentence. Five days out of seven, <laughs> baby. <laughs> what do you want from us? What do you yeah, want? Man. We can only do so much. Yeah. But uh, we the, love pa- you. the Patreon content this week might be a little bit late, just depending on when we can get everything out. Uh, we are actually recording this on Sunday. Yeah. Uh, we got to get and, back in the groove. We got to get our schedule straightened up. There's a lot of stuff going on. It's August. It's September. Sometime coming up. It's still July right now, actually. Well, it is, but you know what that means, though. Next week is the beginning of Big Ass August. Our birthday month. It's our birthday month. That's when uh, we do a do little. You know whose birthday is also on my birthday? Who's? John Stamos. Really? Bill Clinton. <laughs> <laughs> I think we do this every year yeah. where we look up who the famous birthdays are on our birthday. I just came back from Disney and I took a picture in front of the piano that John Stamos played in Full House. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and he also has the same birthday. Where he sang the song to Aunt Becky that uh, made her fall in love with him again. I mean, Aunt Becky. Why wouldn't she fall in love with him? I mean, her. Yeah. I mean, what? Um, But, yes, big ass August. We celebrate our birthdays. We do crazy stuff. We it's it's mostly bonus Patreon content. Um, so you better get on it. Yeah, but it's uh we try to put extra videos out. We try to do just bonus content across the board. Uh, it's just our way to uh you know increase our output. Yeah. Uh, and it's a lot of fun. Maximum R- effort. Maximum content. Maximum ass. Ass. Oh, is that our <laughs> maximum ass? Maximum <laughs> big ass August three. Maximum effort, maximum content, maximum, maximum ass. ass. That's that's this year's uh, theme. Let them cook. Hey, there we go. We figured it out. We normally kick off episodes with flying blind or sips and snacks. Close your eyes. Just I, I can't see anything. Oh, I didn't. I didn't know the rest of the song. Okay. Well, uh, the flying blind is. Still sleeps. I'm just gonna turn my. Oh, my body is so I sore too. I so on top of like being on stage for four hours straight. So also, um, this gig, I, on, on top of being from you know ten thirty to two thirty, I didn't have a set break, right? Uh, so I played for four hours straight through. I I I did not I did not have you a break. Oh, okay, thank you. Um, Why did I didn't, you let them? That sounds like slavery. I didn't. <laughs> there is no let. There is no. That sounds like slavery. Yeah, I. <laughs> there's no option. That's just how did it they is. At least dr- give you drinks. Oh yeah. Oh, oh no. no. Okay. I. Do you have a catheter in? Did Ryan Reynolds just blink at me? Yeah. Okay. He does that every once um, in a while. I didn't. I didn't have to pee. You peed on yourself. Didn't I you? didn't. I did not have to pee at all. He peed on himself. I will be very honest with you. I didn't have to pee until I woke up this morning. Damn. Yeah. You didn't even pee after the show. Nope. God. When I played shows, my favorite pee was the after show pee. <laughs> 
was like waking up morning. Somehow, somehow too. And peeing. I, I was like, you know what sounds so good? Just a big old cheeseburger or some Taco Bell <gasps> or something. Biscuit. Taco Bell? Fuck Taco Bell, bro. We've already gone over this. Wow. But I didn't I didn't eat anything after the show. You are crazy. Yeah. You I I was so ready just to go home and get in bed. And I felt like I was going to have like a food hangover more than I was anything else. You know what I mean? Yep. Like I was just going to be bloated from food. I was going to feel really bad. I was so just exhausted from all of it. But, hey, rock and roll, baby. Rock and roll. Oh. You like that? It smells like a cake pop. Ooh. I like that. It does. What flavor? Strawberry. Strawberry. Flying blind. Yeah, I just poured. Peria oh yeah, blind. I, I was. You, I was. If starting... you're listening and you're not watching, I just poured Peria blind, and now we're trying. I was starting to explain flying blind too, but I think you can kind of figure it out. But if you if you don't know what it is, we blind each other with something at the top of the episode. Yeah, or sometimes we do a pairing, and but today we're doing a blind. Yeah, we haven't we haven't done uh, sips and snacks in a while. Next week, found something. Oh. I got something for you too. Oh, I like how you said that so low. I got something, I got for, something you for you too. too. That's just kind of the uh, fact that my allergies are so bad. I like it right now. I like it. But anyway, he likes it. I think it's so creamy. Ooh, it is creamy. Hang on. It's taking me someplace. Where Take, am I going? Where are you Where going? am I going? Tell me where you're going. Where am I going with this? Tell me where you're going. Where are you going? My friend. I don't even know the song. But. Where v- are you going? V- huh? Valhalla? You just died. Valhalla. Why am I getting this like. Pound cake vibe. Because it's good. There's something, cakey. it is cakey. Cookie, sugar cookie. Yes. Yeah. Especially on the finish. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Little fruit. Little fruit. Okay. But there's also, there's not an unsubstantial amount of oak Mm-mm. either. I would, I would not be surprised if this were... A weeder, think so. Maybe. I don't. I don't. Maybe. I don't really know. Maybe. Maybe. You like it though, right? I love this. I'll I'm, be honest. I'm with glad you. you love it. I've been on. I've been on a weeder kick recently. I like that. Um, I like that. I. Th- this is dipping into what have we been drinking recently territory. But I. Uh, I've been taking. Larceny Barrel Proof, right? Uh huh. And the new Heaven Hill Grain to Glass Weeder. Yeah. Two to two. Fifty fifty blend. One to one. One to one. And that is make me that and bring it to me next. Next time. week. Next week. That'll be your uh, your post op. Okay. Treat. Gotcha. I can't wait because that was my favorite of that series. That weeder. Yeah. Um. I got to guess on what this is. What. It's the rare character exceptional series, isn't it? It is. Yeah. It is. I had to share this with you because there's only a little bit left. Yeah. It's so good, man. Um, I think this is better than the bottle I have. This is because this is this is a straight whiskey. This is not a malt. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the one I have is a, a bourbon. Oh, I thought it was a malted one. No, it's a bourbon. Oh. I couldn't remember. <laughs> um, if you're looking at the screen, this is a rare character. 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 The exceptional well, series. Character. Really? Um, it's freaking crazy, man. Nine-year, three-month Kentucky straight bourbon whiskey, 121.84 proof. Um, We could probably eventually find out where this was. Ours are very similar. Um, I, uh, I went to enemy territory. 
my daily bourbons place. Um, I had some bottles that I thought he would appreciate. I gave him that. And he gave me this to take on vacation. Um, so I took this. It's a rare character. It's the the beach club. The rare beach club. I don't know who that is, but you all picked a great one. To me, you hit it on the head when you were saying pound cake and yeah. cookie. I thought it tasted like... I made a post about this. I th- thought it tasted like a... Uh, fruit pizza with like a sugar cookie crust, extra cream cheese. Um, this was great. Uh, I still hate you, Chad, but thank you for that. <laughs> um, but I enjoyed this all through. He vacation. is your number one fan, though. It, it's he's true. wearing your merch. He wears my merch. He he's actually got more merch than some people um, do. You have you have more than him, but it is by like. Maybe a shirt in the class. Yeah, but I'm saying he's got like the second biggest whiskey mutant collection of stuff. Yeah, so I'm the first. You're the first. Oh, cool. Yeah, you got the you got stuff before anybody. Yeah. Um, but I uh, wore a, I wore a whiskey mutant shirt on last week's episode. Did you? Yeah. Talking to keep right. you uh, to keep you close to my heart. You'll be in my heart, no matter what they say. Um, that song didn't have to go so hard, but it did. But, man. but also Phil leading Collins. into what have I been drinking? Um, I drank this bottle at the resort, uh, uh, the Polynesian Resort at Disney, and then I took it to Hilton Head Beach. And there's a little bit left, and I made sure because I wanted Perry to try some of it. So you flew with this bottle. This bottle was sealed before. Right. Yes. But you also flew home with it. No, I drove home. You drove home. Remember, I told you my. I got to tell you about my rental car. Oh, yeah, issue. I know, but I thought that you, I thought you flew home. No, we drove home. We flew down and drove home. I thought you flew home. Mm-mm. Okay. No, oh, I'm glad I didn't fly home because you know whole, you might not have been here. I might not have been here because <laughs> this whole thing. Also, at work, apparently, my system that I run shut down. Because, really? So I will be rebuilding that tomorrow. That's what. Oh. <laughs> oh yeah it shut down so july 19th when that thing went down yeah that whole day is pretty much missing in our payroll and stuff so i have to be there early to oh my gosh rebuild everything and make sure everybody's payroll is good you know you want to know something funny though on the flip side of that our systems didn't go down and <laughs> and we were all like hoping that they would <laughs> you're like Fuck. we basically did we we're like just like an hour you um, know just an hour where we could go just come on please please I, i'm going to touch on my issue that my travel issue on yeah. on uh hot takes later down the road yeah um but you know, after we do this, we always talk about what have we been drinking. You touched a little bit on yours. Yeah. Um. I, like I said, I took this to my whole uh trip. It's been good. I enjoyed it. Um. A quick recap while Perry. Um. Are we gonna do the? Yes, we are gonna do the jet juice. Yes. Uh, I will do a very quick one because um mine is not nearly as extensive as yours is gonna be because. Uh, this is this is how we trade off when one of us goes to Disney. Yeah, we're like, I drank uh, <laughs> Wild Turkey 101, and then you're like, I drink everything. Yeah, exactly. Um, and what's funny is that I did drink Wild Turkey 101 uh, and Miller Lite at the gig last night. Um, but also, this is not benchmark foolproof. This is a little Perry's punch. What? So what a do little, you mean it's a little Perry. Well, this is a little That's f- Perry's punch. Yeah, this is a little fun. Um, is this uh, Perry's punch too? No, this is a little fun uh, industry secret for folks who don't know about, you know, uh, what 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 uh, what musicians might do on stage. Sometimes we bring alcohol up on stage with us. You know, straight edge. <laughs> asking the host of a <laughs> bourbon podcast um so i i made a little i made a little uh concoction so this is a 
Perry's punch. As in Perry's punch. Yes. Not yeah. Perry's punch as right, in right. like. This doesn't have you know, anything to do with that. No. Okay. This is Anytime a. Anytime Perry makes a concoction, we like to call it Perry's punch. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, okay. So this is a blend of uh, some some bourbons. <sighs> That's good. And uh, <laughs> it ain't it ain't too bad, man. But this was my on stage. Uh, if there, I needed a quick little has refill, to be Craig barrel proof. Oh yes, there is. I was gonna say. Yeah. This yeah. is. This is a. Strawberry snickerdoodle, yeah, cookie. There is, there is benchmark foolproof in it. So I I pulled up this bottle. It's a benchmark foolproof bottle. Uh, benchmark foolproof Knob Creek single barrel, Jack Daniel single barrel barrel proof larceny. All the proofs. All the proofs. All the proofs. That's the point. Larceny barrel proof. Elijah Craig barrel proof. Um, I'm trying to think if there was anything else I went into. Did I think you that's, have any like. Calculations, or are you just throwing shit? No, nah, just throwing stuff I like together. That. I like that. Yeah, that was kind of the point. It's a strawberry snickerdoodle. It, like if you took a snickerdoodle cookie and you had strawberry icing on it, that's what this would be. Yeah. How much did you have on stage? Because this has to be like 190 proof, right? <laughs> yeah, it's ever clear. Yeah. Um, I did not have a whole lot okay. on stage. Um, I, I had, this I had, I would have. Fallen over, been bleeding. Yeah, because I no, I, I would have bashed my head on. Again, I had to play for four hours straight. Right, right. Um, so I was mostly drinking Miller Light. That's delicious. And Turkey One Hundred and One. I like that. Um, so any, I, I just, I needed like one refill of bourbon. Um, oh, and I had a Mick, Mick Ultra, as well. I want to show you one one thing though. What? Just just one thing before we move on. Okay. Okay. So last week. Uh, when I was recording my solo episode, mm-hmm. um, I was anticipating a package from Heaven Hill. Okay. Okay. And I thought what I was going to be receiving was the new Elijah Craig Toasted Rye. And I was like, well, I could either review. I didn't know that was this. a thing. Yeah. Toasted rye? Toasted rye. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. I, I said I could either review the new uh, Elijah Craig Toasted Rye, which I was really excited about, or I could review the Bullet Barrel Strength Batch 8, which I did not like that much, and I was kind of That's sour what you on did, right? That's what I did. Did you just bash it? Is Go it, and listen to it if you haven't done so already. We'll talk about it off air. Okay. Um, so I streamed it on Twitch, right? Because that's what I like to do when I'm doing solo episodes because it helps me kind of like center myself and, you know, if I need something to bounce off of. Right. Uh, usually there's people there chatting with me. Uh, I don't typically like to do it on YouTube because... The, I don't know. There's something about the... Anyway. I got you. Um, it wasn't the Elijah Craig Toaster, right? Hmm. What was it? It was Larceny. Small batch. Larceny small batch. What the fuck? With their new, with their new label. Just the new label. Just just the new label. Okay. Do we now, need to show this or are we going to read Well, it? no, show go ahead and show the label. Is this supposed to be we're black in it or something? Yeah. Have you seen this? I saw somebody post where they showed a larceny in a black lot, but I didn't understand what it was. Okay. So the whole thing with I this need to turn the lights off. Nah. Okay. Okay. Well, you can you can you'll be able to see it just fine. It can't it doesn't matter. Do I need to hold it up or something? Maybe turn the lights off. I don't know. So the whole thing with this new packaging is that it was... It's supposed to represent the... The The story that... The secret. The story that's hidden or whatever. Right? Okay? So... 
if you're watching the video, you basically just see the key, you see larceny, right? But then they sent us this little black light flashlight, right? And you shine it on it. I'll show you. And yeah. you can see the text better. Yeah. I can still see the text without it, though. Yeah, Is but that's it. Special? No, that's it. Give me this. I'm not even kidding. No, else? that's it. I mean, but you can read it. I know. I can look. If you're watching, you can see that text. Yeah. I mean, that's it. Yeah, that's the whole thing. Did this? Does this light come with every bottle? No. Okay, come on, heaven. Hill. You got to stop. <laughs> you got to stop, heaven. Hill. Ridiculous, right? I love you, heaven. Hill, but this this is. It's it, it feels like a waste. If you put that, I mean, maybe if you put like this lot with it, it'd be fun, but it's just. Anyway, so you went to Disney. So I went to Disney. Oh, and I'm going to make a drink for us uh, real oh, quick. Oh, yeah, make too. a drink because yeah. there's a drink that I had at Disney that Perry has been working on to make at home. Um, I'll tell you about that. Um, yes, I was on vacation, obviously. Um, I left Perry solo. Um, that's okay. It's okay. Sometimes I did the gotta, same thing you to you before. Do it solo before. Uh, anyway, <laughs> so uh, so we were at Disney. Um, stayed at the uh, Polynesian Resort, which Ugh. was great. Um, and of course, at their bar there, um, the Kona Cafe, um, they had um, the Knob Creek Parks and Resorts, which I trolled everybody. Um, because I had that, and you made always, me so mad. You always got to get the parks and resorts pick. It's Knob Creek pick. Yeah, they have it at random bars throughout Disney, but they also have it at Disney Springs. And I stopped at a stand uh, at Disney Springs, and they had it. And I said, "Hey, can I take a picture with?" It? And he's like, he goes, "It'll look better with this full bottle." And I go, "Can I buy that bottle?" And he's like, "No, unfortunately, I can't sell it." I tried to buy that bottle from everybody, um, but he said it'll make a good picture. Won't Did you it? even try it, Ohana? Yeah. Yeah, I did the same thing. I tr no uh, the the bar, Ohana, uh, Kona Cafe, every place I had it. I tried it. I tried to get them to give me a bottle. I asked and I couldn't. Uh, I even talked to the bartender about how I got it at Coronado Springs the last time I had it, and the, he said the only reason I got it then was because I was I lucked up because they had celebrities there on site and they were extra bottles left. Can I, was I like, can I ask you a very important question real quick before you go any further? Yes. Would you like extra bourbon in your jet juice? Yeah, we're sipping on it. It's fine. Okay. Um, so anyway, I had that. But the guy at Disney Springs was like, oh, you got to take a good picture. So he gave me a full bottle, unopened, and I posted it. And people blew my message up thinking that I found a bottle to buy. And I went along with it for a little bit. But unfortunately, I did not get a full bottle. I only took a picture with it. I was so mad. So I was yes. so mad for a little while. I know, I know. And and to the point, and I didn't mean for it to come off the way that it did, but we it, we were texting back and forth. And I don't even remember what you you had sent. But I I sent you a message and all I said was, Did you get a bottle? Yeah. And you were like, or I did you get one or something? And you were like, that's a picture of blah, blah, blah. And I, all I sent back was stop. <laughs> Not, <laughs> and it meant, the way that it was meant to come off was like, stop. Right. You right, know, right, right. but it just came off like, stop right now. <laughs> I hate you. You're being, you're being the worst. I know, I know. And I, and I didn't mean for it to come off that no, way, no, but I'm it was, being, it, I was I know, you, it was just full, full on mute. Full on mute. But it was so funny. Um, so I had my Knob Creek. I had, uh, at, let's, let's break it down by parks. Um, this is, this is the, the real. Chile. Yeah. So, uh, I'm, I'm making the jet yeah, tell juice. Them what you're making. Um, I had a jet cocktail. juice. Cocktail. Jet Juice For is us. a Maker's Mark cocktail that you get at Oga's Cantina um, in Galaxy's Edge at Hollywood Studios. It's my favorite uh, Galaxy's Edge drink. One of my favorite uh, Disney cocktails. It's called the Jet Juice. Um, that's the only place you can get it, and Perry is making it right for us right now. Yeah. It's a very spicy boy. It's got a little chili liqueur in it. Right? And Yeah, and the, the kicker to it 
is the Ancho Reyes Chile Ancho Liqueur. Uh, that, it, that gives it the thank you. Uh, <laughs> that gives it the spice. Yeah. Um, I found the exact liqueur. That's awesome. Uh, and just wait. Yes. Um, so let's see. Hollywood Studios. I uh, did. Uh, we did Oga's. Me and April got to have a little side date. The kids were riding rides and doing stuff. Um, and we got to have That's a little nice. side date. It was nice. Um, and I had um, uh, some jet juice. Um, also had my Coruscant cooler, which we had on the pregame chats, um, if you want to listen to that. Um, also, I um, had uh, my Mutant Brew, which... Oh, yes. You go to a Joffrey's at any, any of the Joffrey's that have alcohol... And you ask for a shaken Jamaican, but you substitute the cream for Bailey's. And then you say, top it off with some Irish whiskey, because that's usually what they have at those. It's the Mutant Brew. Don't even worry about if they look at you funny. It's Disney. You're on vacation. You can drink You can drink a full-blown cocktail, coffee cocktail at 9 in the morning if you want. Had that. Um, going over to Epcot, I had um, a Violet Saki which was the, one of the most refreshing drinks. They sell it there at the Japanese Pavilion. Um, also had my favorite margarita. It's not a margarita. I won't say a margarita. It's called the Corn Old Fashioned. They sell it at... It's not a margarita. I uh, know, but it's at La Cava del Tequila, which is pretty much all margaritas, yeah. which I got their hat on right now. You want to see that? Um, it's a Corn Old Fashioned. You get... Um, mezcal and it's got a uh, rye whiskey in it so good you got to get that um something new that i had was a ice cream martini um at uh france so good i got chocolate on chocolate on chocolate it had vodka in it don't murder me it was so good um so good uh let's see Going over to Magic Kingdom. Magic Kingdom is, there's only a few restaurants that um, sell alcohol. Um, I went to Skipper's, and I had the, uh, what's the beer that they only have there? It's oh, like the, I can't remember. Sorry. I'm, it's, a, it's a brown ale. It's a brown ale. You can only, it's nutty as hell. It's so, so good. good. So good, so good, so good, so um, good. I had all my resort pours in the room. Um, there's so much more. That's just a quick recap. If you want a full list of things I recommend at Disney, um, just message me. I, I, I post, I'm, I, I took videos and snapshots of everything. So I'm going to make a reel of like whiskey mutants, like top drinks and top snacks and all that. So you'll see that coming soon. I could talk, me and Perry have already talked about this. We could talk hours upon hours about Disney snacks, food, drinks, and, you know, I could talk hours on it. And more on that soon, maybe? More on that soon, maybe. Let's, this already smells, I just smelled it. I cheated. I smelled a little bit. It smells like a jet juice. I mean. bro. I mean, it's it. Where's that? Li where's that lot at? Where's that lot at? Yep, jet juice. I see it. I mean, it it it's it. I see it. It looks like jet juice. Smells like jet juice. Tastes like jet juice. It's giving you the. Look at that. It's giving you the heartburn. Oh, it's giving you the. The glow oh, I, I, in I camera drank too. Two of these, and I felt so good. <laughs> and then I went and rode Star Tours four times in a row. Yeah, we uh, we had a really fun uh, back and forth over text. Yeah, on your uh, <laughs> your yes. experiences on um, Star Tours, which was hilarious. Yes, I was trying to get all the new scenes, and I got like two out of the three, I believe. Um, but I kept sending Perry pictures of me with the glass Star Tours glasses on, and they, I made sure I was doing something different every time to it was get like so good. different effect. It was fun, like Perry did. I I like how when Perry recapped his trip, he was like, you know, I don't have to go over everything. I like to keep it to myself. I posted a ton, so you probably saw it. I I did tried to get some of the hardest 
Disney pictures ever with my fits. You killed it, dude. Yeah. I it had, made me it made me want to up my fit game listen, the next time that we go to Disney. Early tips and bits. Roosevelt's <laughs> shirts. Like no joke, these are button-up shirts. I wore them all week and they felt better than t-shirts. They are breathable. Like the sweat just kind of rolls off of them. That's awesome. They're not sticky. I I will 100% say wear them the whole trip when you're there. So, early tips and bits. That's it. Folks, I am super excited to be welcoming to the podcast one of the co-founders of Found North. It's Nick Taylor. Nick, you uh, were telling me before we got started that you've had quite the uh, quite the few days, but uh, I'm I'm very thankful that you joined me for this uh, this little sit down chat that we're we're having this evening. <laughs> yes, yes, it's good to be here. My uh, my my dog saw the Grim Reaper and barked him away and so he's fine and now we're like we're all okay in in the household here but it's it's been yeah it's best, definitely been a week but i'm uh, i'm excited thanks for having me on we also share something uh as in similarity as well in that we we have pregnant wives and uh th- this is not your first child no. as well Chris. number one Number this is your one. very first one. Oh my gosh! <laughs> yeah. Okay, congratulations! Maybe congratulations! Girl, way. I know. I'm how excited. how uh, how has that found you so far? How are you uh, feeling with uh, your first child oh, knocking man. on the door? It's um, she did us a favor, and she's arriving in the like only quiet period in the whiskey industry. You know, her due date is <laughs> July 29th, and it's like August is the only month that anybody in the whiskey industry ever takes off. You know, right, so um, right. I, I'm I'm really excited. I'm really excited. It's funny. All my friends have. Um, so I have so many friends who have one, two year olds, and they're and they're boys, and I am really excited to have a girl. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, uh, yeah. my, my first was a girl and, uh, my second is going to be a girl and then I'm going to be done. So <laughs> I, I'm calling it, I'm calling it quits after two. Uh, and my, my wife is currently, uh, well, almost seven months pregnant and, Woo. um, we're, we're in the thick of it and I'm, I'm, it's not that I'm ready for it to be over. Uh, I think she's way more ready for it to be over than oh. I am by as many stretch of the imagination as you possibly can. Um, but also, it, you know, she said well before the pregnancy really got into it, how much she loved being pregnant last time. The last time she was pregnant, we were in the middle of lockdowns and COVID mm. and we didn't have a three-year-old to run after and yeah. she didn't have to be a mom, you know, and, so this one's been a little bit more difficult. <laughs> can can she can she not pick the the other one up right now? Not she. Not supposed she to. Do, she's not supposed to. And yeah. I will leave it at that. I will leave yeah. it at that. <laughs> I, I, I have a good friend who's who's has a um, uh, two year old and another on the way, and she can't pick up the kid, and that's been like the biggest problem. Yeah. Um, which is really fascinating there. Yeah. Yeah. There's, it's funny how, um, I don't have conver I like, I have two types of conversations now in my life. I talk about whiskey and I talk about babies and it's literally yeah. like all my friends have one and two year olds and, and I have, and my wife's 38 weeks pregnant and it's like, these are yeah. the two things that I talk about. <laughs> Here you go. And we're doing it. We're doing both at the same time. So what do you know? Hi, how's that? You know, um, so we, uh, you know, we normally kick off episodes uh, of the podcast in general by asking each other, myself and Eric, what have you been drinking recently? So mm. I wanted to ask you, Nick, uh, and it doesn't even have to be found north, which uh, we're going to get into here in just a moment. But is there anything you've been drinking recently that uh, might have might have piqued your interest or might pique the interest of our, our listeners? Everyone's going to like find me and kick me in the shins um, because <laughs> I did a um, I did a, a I do a, um, a charity event every year with um, a friend of mine who has just a ridiculous uh, collection of dusties and um, he sells tickets and we raise money for um, we raise money for for uh, student aid for a school that that his kids are at um, and uh, and I do it for I always do it for free but he always gives me a bottle of something afterwards um, and, and this year he, 
This year he gave me the 2014 stag, which I immediately opened and have been drinking. Um, and good God, like, I, I feel like it's such a, um, it's such a cliche these days to, to be upset with Buffalo trace antique collection. Cause nobody can ever get it. Um, but, but, but when you open it and, <laughs> and you just enjoy it, it's kind of like, um, it's really, they, they really do, um, they do such amazing work. And, and that 2014 was, um, an incredible whiskey, which, which is funny because I, um, I did get to taste it in 2014. Um, I was working, uh, I was working at my first job in the whiskey industry, which was, uh, I was a, a spirits buyer as a whiskey buyer for a chain of retailers, um, in Massachusetts. And when you work for a chain of whiskey, uh, for, for a chain of retailers and you, and you're a whiskey buyer, um, you get to see all of the allocated bottles, but you never get to drink them, uh, cause you have to sell them to your best customers. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Right. You know, so you like hold the bottles. It's, it's, it's a little bit of torture. Um, and I sold the 2014, uh, stag to, um, a nice, a nice customer of mine. And he, uh, he came in the next day and he had a, um, he had a 60 ml, like a big fat sample oh. of it. And he gave it to me and he said, uh, he said, Hey, you know, I know how this works. I know you're, you're going to get to see this and you sold it to me, but you're not going to get to try it. Um, and I just wanted to let you know that I wasn't flipping it, um, which I thought was a really nice gesture, you know? And, and, uh, and in so, 2014, uh, yeah, back in 2014. Yeah. So that's, so I, that's interesting. Yeah. So I, I wow. took it. I took it um, and I was having dinner with my parents that night. Um, so I took it to over to my folks house and they had just redone the kitchen. Um, so everything was kind of all around and I got there and they're running late because they're always running late. And, you know, my dad's <laughs> yelling at my mom to get out of the shower and whatever. And I'm sitting there with this with this 2014 stag and I'm like, I, I'm going to drink this right now. Um, so I went and grabbed a rocks glass and I put it in there and I, I put it down on the counter it, it's it's 140 proof or whatever you know it's 139 eight or whatever exactly is and yeah and uh, and so I was like okay I, I'm gonna do they have a bottle of water I'm just gonna put a, a, a drop of water in I'm gonna drink it neat and then I'm gonna put a few drops of water and just see what happens and I'm I'm kind of lost in the kitchen trying to find a, um, a a bottle of water and my dad comes into the kitchen and he sees the glass of whiskey and he scoops it up and he looks at me and he goes this shit's bad for you. And he boom shoots it down. Oh. <laughs> and Papa Taylor. My, my dad doesn't drink cast drink whiskey. He doesn't drink drink. Papa whiskey. Taylor. So what are you doing? It's 140 proof, right? So it's just, it's just it just sears his lungs, you know? And he's got a coffee and he goes, oh, and it's awful. And then he leaves. And I, I couldn't get a word out. I mean, I literally and um I, I had a Twitter account at the time, so I tweeted out the story to my 30 followers, um, and uh, one of them happened to be that guy, and he comes in the next day with another 60 ml, and he hands it to me, and he says, keep this away from your dad. Um, so that's when I tried the, the 2014 stag for the first time, um, and I got to tell you, I liked it a lot better this time. Um, I, 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 I felt I felt that I could appreciate it more sort of 10 years into the game here um sure than, than i could 10 years ago and back then i i was i i didn't have the full appreciation for um barrel proof that i do now um and and i i i really am enjoying it i really am enjoying I'm, gl it. I'm glad, I'm glad. <laughs> <laughs> how, how much of your appreciation now for barrel proof whiskey cast strength whiskey influenced your your kind of desire to put out cast strength products with with found north i mean because it you know everything that is sitting in front of me all four of these products they all say cast strength whiskey yep. on them yeah I, I think there's there's a couple things i think um you know i i'm a i'm a huge fan of uh lou bryson's book uh tasting whiskey i think if you're getting into whiskey and you want something that will take you from elementary to like not you're not going to be an automatic whiskey expert but you're going to have like a pretty good sense of whiskey if you just read this one book um it's tasting whiskey and in the introduction um lou talks about how he was a 
he was he was part of malt advocate before it became whiskey advocate when beer was bigger than whiskey um and he wasn't much of a whiskey drinker and he kind of had to get into drinking whiskey um and you know he talks about how when you when you drink whiskey the 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 reaction that ha- occurs on your palate is the same as the reaction that occurs when you're um when you're drink when you're consuming a really spicy food um in the same way that you can kind of uh, train your palate to appreciate spicy food by slowly increasing the the spiciness rating or whatever you actually can um become more and more tolerant of higher and higher strength whiskey um uh, and I think when I first started drinking whiskey, particularly because I was really drawn to, to scotch initially, um, I was drinking mostly things that were 40 to 46 percent. Um, but I started I started drinking, um, you know, I started drinking some of these really interesting uh, cast strength um, scotches. But with scotch, the ABV starts at 63.5 percent and it goes down. Um, it never goes up. You know, it's not like bourbon. Um, so even the cast drink stuff I was drinking was 51, 52, you know, it's 102, 104 proof, which is obviously higher. Um, but it wasn't really until I started working in the whiskey industry, um, and, and, and started going on the Kentucky bourbon trail and picking single barrels, um, that I started trying these like, you know, higher proof 120 plus range stuff. Um, and I absolutely fell in love with it. I mean, I really fell in love with it. I, 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 I love it. Um, I love it for the texture. Um, I've always loved it for the texture. I think, um, I think it's funny because when we blend, we, we don't blend for nose. That's not to say we don't care about the nose, but we don't blend for nose. Um, we bet we blend primarily for landing and everything else is, is after that. And what I mean by landing is like, Obviously, it's just the first impression. The first impression is the the preview is the is is the nose, but the first impression is the opening scene of the movie. You know what I mean? Like the the, the landing is is and what I found is that the most memorable aspect of a whiskey is how it hits you. Um, the rest of the story is really important. I don't mean to downplay it. I'm not saying that nothing else is important, but um, I think at strength. Uh, a whiskey when it lands it lands with authority and it it shows you what its texture is it 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 shows you um i i i love that sensation of the the um fred minute calls it the snap crackle pop that the kind of the sensation of it um just switching from sweet to spice at the same time that the texture kind of spreads out through the back of your palate and through the kind of midsection of your palate um that's my that's maybe my favorite aspect of drinking whiskey altogether and i've never had a non-cast drink whiskey that does that to be honest you know it's like i've had a lot of great whiskeys that are 44 45 46 abv um but they're not going to do that um and so that was that was the from just a purely flavor standpoint it was just just enjoyment just blending for our own palates um it wasn't ever going to be anything other than cast strength whiskey. Um, but, uh, I also think making Canadian whiskey, there's a, there's, we're, we're fighting an uphill battle making Canadian whiskey. Um, because there are a lot of expectations of how it's going to taste. Um, and we made, we make, you know, we're Americans making Canadian whiskey. And frankly, we're Americans making Canadian whiskey for an American palate. Um, that's not to say there aren't Canadians who love overproof cast strength. Actually, there are a ton of them. I know because I get angry emails pretty much every day from Canadians sure. because we don't sell in Canada. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and they want our You don't sell in either. Canada yet. <laughs> yeah, yes, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, but, but I think Chill I think out everybody. With, it's going to happen. Yeah, eventually. it's coming. It's it's coming. <laughs> but, but I think um for us with Canadian whiskey, um we knew if if we were going to get people to um, take a shot at found North. Um, we needed a few things and one was it needed to be cast strength. It needed to be non show filtered. It needed to have no additives. Um, that's kind of just table stakes. Um, uh, and additionally, we, we were aware we love aged whiskey because of what age allows. Um, but we're not ignorant to the fact that 
there's a level of trust that comes with an age statement. Um, people feel secure spending a certain amount of money on a certain bottle that has a certain number on it. Um, and that's, that's a commercial reality that, that we're not, we, we don't sit here being, Oh, it's not important. You know, <laughs> like, yeah, obviously, um, people care about it, which is funny to say, because you're, you're drinking our eight year, which is the youngest whiskey we ever, uh, we ever released. <laughs> sure, but it's still blended with 21-year-old whiskey. It's actually still mostly 21-year-old whiskey. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah 73% so, 21-year-old whiskey. <laughs> so so while I'm getting into it, because I, I haven't I haven't even taken a sip of it yet, um, it, it, it all kind of is revolving around the question of what led you to move from being a whiskey enthusiast to being... I uh, led down the path of wanting to actually produce whiskey because that's not an that's not an easy jump, you know. I mean, it, it's finding investors, it's finding the time and and people who believe in you too, and a partner hopefully as well who said, "Yeah, you should quit your day job and go." <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> do that. So, um, yeah, I, I, it's funny because I, I, um, there's a. Uh, there's a guy who um, was was kind of the first guy who, who said to me, you should quit your job and go do that. Um, and he's been a mentor to me. Um, his name's Chris Lynch. He's been a mentor um, to me and our team for a really long time. Um, and he was the, the sort of the guy who was like, hey, you should quit your day job and 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 start your own company. Uh, not necessarily make make our own whiskey. Because that was back in 2016. And we didn't launch Found North. We didn't start making Found North till 2020. Um, but but I think what was interesting was my, my brother and I, um, we started working together in 2012. Uh, and that was the first time we tr tried to launch our own business. Um, it didn't go well. Uh, we got the <laughs> shit kicked. We got our teeth kicked in, man. Uh, it, it turns out this is hard. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, uh, but, but it wasn't in whiskey. Um, uh, and, uh, and I had a passion for whiskey. My brother had a passion for entrepreneurship and tech. Um, and we kind of went our separate ways, but we always had this conversation of like, Hey, if we get an opportunity to try this again, you know, the business might not have been the right business, but the partnership was the right partnership. Um, and, uh, and so I had been, I had been doing, um, the big thing I did when I worked uh, really in, in kind of the retail space was, um, I was doing a lot of whiskey tastings and whiskey edu education and seminars and the, the store Gordon's where I, where I worked here in, in, uh, in Waltham, Massachusetts was, had this great, um, uh, culinary center. It had, it had stadium seating for 35 and a full kitchen and I could do anything Ooh. I wanted. And I, and they gave me permission to basically like open anything, post any tasting you want. And I was doing three or four events a week, um, by after, after only about a year. And we were doing like every cool that we did blind tastings of 18 year old single malts. Um, uh, we did, uh, you know, whole aging seminars. We did whiskey 101. We did scotch 101. We did scotches, sorry, whiskeys of the world. We did, you know, barrel proof bourbon. We did everything you could think of. And what I, what we discovered early on was, um, People are as passionate. This is I, I try, my dad never really understood our first business. And 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 I used to explain to him, I said, he used a call for I used to say people are as excited about whiskey, about the hobby of whiskey as you are about the hobby of golf. Like they will travel for it. They will spend a ton of money on it. They want to learn about it. They want to get better at it. Like people don't often think of whiskey as something that you can be quote unquote good at it. But I think a lot of people who are really serious about whiskey. They want to find interesting whiskeys to share with their friends. They want to know, they want to know about it. They want to feel close to it. They want to feel connected to it. They, they want this um, intense enthusiasm that they have for their hobby. They want to experience it with others and share it with others. Um, and what we discovered early on was if we could give people um, an experience that, that connected them closer to whiskey, um, there, there was a market for that. And so when we started our company, we did things like I led tours to Scotland. I led tours to Kentucky. Um, uh, we did, we did, we facilitated barrel picks. Um, we kind of did every little thing we could until we got hired basically as brand ambassadors. Um, and we made money as brand ambassadors for hire for a while. 
Um, and we kind of parlayed that into getting our own importing license. Um, there were a couple, we actually imported Armagnac. Um, there were some, some spirits that we were really interested in. Um, but we always were sort of fixated on whiskey. And uh, when COVID hit, we lost all our contracts and we lost all our partnerships, like overnight. Um, we couldn't do tastings. We couldn't do seminars. We couldn't lead trips. Sure. We couldn't do any of oh, the yeah, stuff. Of that, right. And it was like everybody reached in. People were polite, but they were like, hey, we can't be paying you guys a pretty hefty <laughs> monthly stipend to be sitting on your ass doing nothing. Um, of course. Of course. And the whole time, to be honest, the whole time we were looking for whiskey, um, we were we were pursuing potentially launch uh, building a distillery. Um, but we were the whole time looking for whiskey that 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 we could release, that we could bottle and release. Um, the big problem we had was a couple fold. One, um, a lot of the whiskey that we were already, that we were interested in was already being done well by other people. Right. Um, you know, there was great whiskey at MGP, but we'd be the umpteenth dog to the bowl. You know, there's great whiskey in Scotland, but scotch was getting so expensive. You could buy seven year that you would have to retail for $110 a bottle, you know? And, and I think the big thing for us was, um, there's, I have this really, I, for, I, I should say the big thing for me was, um, I want to do something that's meaningful. I've always wanted to do something that's meaningful for the broader category of whiskey. Um, that's not just meaningful for us, right? That, that something that, um, affects how people drink whiskey, um, affects how they experience, like we just talked about how religious people are about whiskey and I'm religious about whiskey, man. When I, when I step off in, when, when I step off the plane in Louisville, fuck, I, you feel it, right? There's, there's an energy. Yeah. Hell yeah. And I feel the same about Scotland. Uh, when I land in, in, in Scotland, you have to sort of land in Scotland and then drive. Because if you just land in Glasgow, you're like, oh, cool. I'm just in a city. In, in. But the second <laughs> you get out into like Speyside and you, you feel it, you're like, oh, shit. Um, sure, or God sure. forbid, you go to Isla and it's just like, Isla is like a whiskey mecca. You know, you, you this is where <laughs> Isla is basically where I, Irish whiskey sort of made its way up to Scotland in 1450 or whenever the hell it happens, you know. There's this con connectivity that you have. Um, and so making a whiskey where uh, being a, a non-distilling producer where we weren't doing anything to the whiskey and we weren't affecting um, the broader category wasn't very interesting to us. Uh, and that that's that's kind of when we stumbled into Canadian whiskey. Um, and what we discovered about Canadian whiskey was, one, there was incredibly old and good distillate that they were willing to sell us. And that that we could that that we could blend, bottle, and sell for a really reasonable price. Um, and and that's you know take the romance away from it. Like that's kind of something you have to do if you're going to sell whiskey is you know provide value to the consumer. Um, but beyond that, Canadian whiskey has this incredibly rich history and is a really interesting category with excellent distillate. Um, that's just fallen by the wayside over the last 50 years. Um, and I think there's a, there was quickly a, an enormous amount of excitement for us about the prospect of taking a category that has been for a long time blended to be a inexpensive, easy to drink, nice to mix whiskey. Um, and kind of reimagining it in the eye of the beholder and the eye of the beholder being like the American whiskey drinker. And I don't mean like an American, I mean people who drink American whiskey, um, whether you live in Scotland or, or Canada or wherever. But, but I think in the U S you know, whether, whether we're right or not is just, is arbitrary. But in the U S I, I think we have a, a real interest in, big, rich, complex flavor right now. And, and I think it's exciting. Um, and Canadian whiskey has barely dabbled in that. Um, so it's, it's, it, it's sort of like 
it had everything. Canadian whiskey had everything for us. And the big challenge for us was let's, let's convince people that we're worth giving a try. Um, and the other big challenge was we feel like we can't miss. Um, we don't, we, we, we feel like if we release a bad whiskey, we can't get away with it the way that other brands can. Um, there's a certain thing where it's like, if you make, if you make bourbon and you swing and miss, people are like, well, yeah, this one's not great, but I'll try the next one. Um, with Canadian, if we swing and miss, people are going to be like, I never should have fucking bought that bottle. I knew it was Canadian. I knew it. Um, so the hardest thing for us was we had a vision for what the whiskey could be and what we wanted it to taste like. Um, but we knew we had to be absolutely obsessive and neurotic about getting it right every time. Uh, and that's been that's been our whole ethos. It's like, just put absolutely every drop of energy and every drop of money we have into um, getting the liquid right. Get the liquid right and everything's, everything snowballs from there, but get the liquid right. Well, I, and looking at, at the very least, <laughs> what you're calling the, the youngest <laughs> liquid that you've put out Again, even though it does still have 21-year-old whiskey in it, um, it is still an incredibly robust product. And I, I, I do think that even though there is still something that is particularly bright and, and fruity and, and quite inviting about it that doesn't read overtly cast strength about it right that could be something more inviting to somebody who is a little bit less familiar with cast strength whiskey um it doesn't sa seem to sacrifice any of that the, any of that flavor just because there is a little bit younger product in it um so it uh, and and i imagine too that there was something that went into this particular batch. This is batch five of your all's cast strength line. Um, in some of the development here that was born out of necessity. Am I, am I kind of off base with that or yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't necessity. It was, um, it was, uh, sheer dumb luck. No, uh, it was, um, <laughs> Uh, uh, no, it, it's funny because we, we, uh, we, we have a, a saying at found North, which is follow the whiskey. Um, and the notion is that like, you know, whiskey's often described as like painting. It's like, Oh, you're, you're blending whiskey. I should say it's like described as painting. It's like, okay, all the components are your paints and then sure. you paint the picture. Um, yeah. but when you paint random things don't happen, right? Like when you blend whiskey, two plus two does often doesn't equal four, you know, yeah. it's not a, it's not a linear, Absolutely. it's not really a linear experience. And in fact, when you combine certain flavors, a lot of interesting and unexpected things happen. Um, so for us, it's really a combination of when we're blending of having an idea of where we're trying to go. But if, if the whiskey takes us on a tangent and it's a good tangent, we follow it and we see where, where we can go with that. Uh, with batch five in particular, um, we got sent a sample of eight-year-old wheat that had been aged in new American oak for its whole life. Um, and the component was just delicious. I mean, just exquisite. Um, but but kind of like wheat, I, I find wheat to be a really interesting grain to work with in general. Um, I love, I love good wheaters and I don't like bad ones, um, which is a funny thing to say. Cause it's like, <laughs> obviously, right. It sounds like the most obvious statement. Ever. Thanks Nick. But I, but I feel like all the time people are like, do you like wheaters? And it's like, no, I don't like wheaters. And it's like, do you like wheaters? Yes. I love wheaters. And it's like, yeah, well, of for course. Me, yeah, I, yeah. I like good ones and I don't like bad ones. Uh, and, and what I, what I find with, what I've always found with um, weeders is that there's a bit of a challenge with wheat, which is the wheat grain I find at a young age to be really lively and really interesting and really sharp and, and kind of jagged. Um, and I often find that when it's aged for a long time, 
it, it tends to even out and become more of a balanced experience. Um, but you often lose the sort of buttery, um, uh, almost like a, a wheat field loveliness that I like in wheat. You lose it with age. Um, and so there's this tricky little balance of aging it long enough where the mouthfeel and the actual drinking experience is good. Um, but actually not aging it so much that all you have is wood, um, where you just kind of nuke any grain experience you're going to have out of it. Um, and so, uh, we just had this idea. Our blending team had this idea. We said, well, the cool thing about Canadian whiskey is that they do these hundred percent grains, right? So they do hundred percent wheat, hundred percent corn, hundred percent rye. They ferment the still and age them separately. And then they let you blend them together. That's why our whiskey has 16 year this and 25 year this and whatever. It's, it's a, it's a mix of these different components that we're using. So we have this incredibly lovely 21 year old corn that had spent um, 13 years in ex bourbon barrels and then had been transferred and regaged into new American Oak for eight years. Um, and on a whim, we said, what would happen if you took 70% of this really old, lovely corn and you blended it with 30% of this lively, young, kind of um, rapscallion wheat that we had that we really loved the flavor, but it felt like it needed to be tamed. Um, and it worked perfectly which never happened all the time. We have an idea and it's like a hundred iterations later, we get somewhere that's good. This, it was like, we tried it at 70, 30 and we were like, Holy shit. That's good. Um, and then we tried it at 75, 25 and we were like, Oh, we lost a little bit of the wheat. And then we legitimately settled on 73, 27. And that was it. We bottled it. Um, it's the easiest blending experience we've ever had. And we just stumbled into something kind of on a on a, a, a blind throw at the dartboard. Um, we just kind of we, we, we felt like we hit we, we hit the bullseye with this. And um, it so was kind of dumb it, luck. It was kind of <laughs> dumb luck. And, and it was funny because we get we get a ton of um, we get a ton of emails about about the wheat all the time. People people all the time email us and say, like, hey, when are you guys going to do another weeder? Well, the problem is we had like four barrels of this eight-year-old wheat. Um, it wasn't like there was an abundance of this. This was just an experiment, experiment that one of our distillery sure. partners did. Sure. And they liked it, but four barrels was too few for them to do anything with. So they offered <laughs> it to us. Um, so it's not like we could just magically spin this back e- up. Um, exactly. Exactly. Uh, but, but I'll reveal now for the first time that Batch 10 is going to be a weeder. Um, We've been working on it for two years to get it right since we made this is my bourbon podcast five. exclusive. There you go. This is this is an exclusive. This is you're the first person to know. Um, no joke. I think that's why I, I texted Chris and he was like, hey, remember, we're releasing batch. Then I was like, oh, right. That's why we sent him batch. Five. <laughs> um, yeah. So, uh, uh, no, we're really we're really excited about this. And, and we, we we feel like uh, we've released enough really old whiskeys. Um, we feel like we have a, a little bit of cachet where it's like, Hey, I know this one's going to say eight years and it's going to be over a hundred bucks, but just kind of trust us. It has a lot of sure. old whiskey in it. Um, yeah. and it worked this weird combination of young wheat, old corn actually works really well. And we're really happy about it. I'm not upset with it either. So <laughs> I look forward to, to batch 10 <laughs> for sure. <Good. laughs> Batch seven, though, uh, 18 years old. Uh, yeah. And we didn't even talk about the, uh, it's specifically the proof on batch five. Uh, yeah. It's one. 16.2. One 16.2. Yeah. Uh, this guy is one. Th- I'm just going to let you tell me because I'm 131.8. terrible at math. I was a math student or I was a uh, art student, so I didn't use math very often. I was a history um, and political science major, and I talk about science all the time. It's hilarious. You use it more <laughs> often than I do, though. So, <laughs> <Maybe>. <laughs> um, so this is an 18-year-old uh, Canadian whiskey. Uh, yep. 83% corn, 16% rye, 1% barley, matured in Hungarian oak. It, now, it... One thing that I want to try to maybe clarify, but also 
Uh, I'm I'm not entirely sure if this is going to be something that you can clarify across the board for all of these products because it doesn't seem like that this might necessarily be a hundred percent true for everything. When it when it has these percentages, that doesn't mean that there is a you know this one eighteen year old whiskey is basically a bourbon mash bill, right? I- it's no. that is kind of a derived mash bill based on everything else that's in there. Correct. Yeah. And, and we, it's funny because, um, this says maturation Hungarian Oak, but our new bottlings, uh, batch nine, which I have over here, we changed that word maturation to key component. Um, mm, which, okay. Which is important for us because, um, we, and we'll get into it with Peregrine and, and hell diver in a minute here, but, but we have basically two processes. Um, we do our batches are, are like straight blends where literally what we do is we blend the components together. Um, I, I guess maybe I shouldn't use the word straight because it has such a connotation with American whiskey, but they're, they're basically blends where we just blend them to their specification and it's done um, with our high altitude collection, which are any of the ones that have bird names um, with the, with the birds. What, what we effectively do is we create a blend and then actually we take that entire blend, recast it into different um, finishing casks, further mature those casks, and then blend them all back together. So there's really this like much more arduous process. Um, and in those, it's really a finish, right? We're doing specific types of finishes. Um, with the batches, the key component is when we blend, we usually blend our whiskeys around a very specific um We'll, we'll blend them around a very specific component whiskey. Um, so if we, in the case of, of this batch, we had an 18 year rye that was aged in Hungarian Oak. Um, it's a spectacular rye. We've actually used it in a bunch of our different whiskeys. Um, and, uh, we built the whole whiskey. We, we literally structured the whole whiskey around it. So the, the other sort of thing on the label for us that, that can be a little confusing is, it, it doesn't say mash bill. We actually just write the word grain. Um, and, and the reason is exactly what you were just saying there. This is not a mash, right? This is not, um, we did not take, uh, you know, 8,300 tons of corn, mix it with, you know, 1,600 tons of, right. You know, this isn't a thing where it's, where it's grain by weight. And in fact, um, these are the liquid ratios which makes it even more confusing um, because when you do a mash, a mash bill is, is the weight of the grain. It's, it's not the, um, it's not the ratio of liquid that's in there. And, and this is, I, I, I talk a lot about this when I get the chance, basically uh, if you were to make a whiskey, the way we make whiskey is we um, convert the starch in the grain to, to sugar and, um, and then we we uh, add yeast. The yeast eats the sugar and creates a beer. And then we distill it. And distilling is basically, very simply put, messing around with boiling points. The boiling point of alcohol is lower than the boiling point of water. So we can basically heat it up to a temperature where the alcohol is boiling off, but the water isn't. Condense those vapors. We have whiskey, right, once we age it. So um, the really interesting thing about that first step is... The starch content, the starch content in corn is much, much, much higher than the starch content in rye. So a bourbon mash bill where you have, say, 70 percent corn and 25 percent rye, the liquid in that bottle is not going to be 70 percent whiskey made from corn and 25 percent whiskey made from rye. Um, The starch content in corn is about twice as high as the starch content in rye. So you get twice as much sugar. Um, so a 70, 25, five bourbon mash bill by liquid ratio is going to end up being like 85, 12, three, right. Um, you're, you're going to get way more alcohol from the corn than you are from the rye proportionately. Um, so for us, when we say the liquid ratio, and this happens all the time because people will drink that seven and say, Wow, you know, it's 83% corn and it's 16% rye, but the rye spice comes through so much. And it's like, yes, because your 
if you are configuring your brain to mash bills, a 16% rye doesn't sound very high. But if we had to make this whiskey by the weight of grain that was used to make this whiskey, it would be more like, well, ironically, like 70, 25 or, or even a little high. It'd be like 70, 28, 1. 70, 28, 2, I guess I should say. Um, so, yeah. So labeling has been a bitch for us is basically the moral <laughs> of that story. <laughs> so that's it. I mean, it, essentially, every time that you're putting out a new product, you're having to submit a new label. Correct. Um, actually, you can mess with the we, we, we don't have to submit for a new cola, believe it or not. Um, Interesting. Yeah, OK, you're you're legally allowed within the code. So there are things you can change with cola. Um, and one of them is grain ratio, as long as the type of whiskey doesn't change. So, like, if this got to the point where it was 51 percent rye. And therefore, we changed the status of it to be a cast strength rye. We, we can't use the same cola because it's it's changed categories. Um, but if it stays within the same category and the proof changes or the grain ratio changes, you're actually still compliant. I know it's stupid. Hello, government. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know you're listening. <laughs> Eventually, when this goes into the uh, you know Library of Congress and <laughs> however many years. I know they're going to review this and be like, ah, yeah. shit, we got to change the laws. Uh, maybe we shouldn't have done that so many years ago. No, I'm kidding. Uh, interesting though. Yeah. I mean, I, I had no idea about the, um, the liquid ratios versus I guess what the actual grain ratios were that that's yeah. a completely new concept to me that I'm, I'm imagining that there are, you know, listeners, viewers as well who had, never heard of that before as well and and was was that something that you were aware of going into oh. your your whiskey so, you, so how, how from, were you you learned okay go ahead sorry <laughs> I learned from Davin de Kergamo uh, Davin de Kergamo is the whiskey writer for Canadian whiskey um uh, and I was reading his book early on when we were getting into into whiskey and and it suddenly dawned on me why everybody thought our rye content was always so much higher than was listed. And I was like, because it effectively is. Um, <laughs> and, and I was blown away. I had a conversation with him about it after, um, after reading his book. And I was like, Oh, son of a gun. Okay. Yeah. That makes perfect sense because I've, the, the, the science behind it actually makes perfect sense to me. You, you get a, you get a beer if if you make 100% corn beer um and and you are very efficient in that process which big distilleries are very 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 efficient in converting um that grain into alcohol um you'll you'll get about 16% alcohol by volume beer um but rye is such a feisty little grain if you're really efficient you can probably get it up to 9% and distillation we always think of distillation as increasing the alcohol content, but the real way to think about it is, is subtracting water. Um, cause that's what you're doing. You're separating the alcohol from the water. So if you have a hundred liters of alcohol at, um, 16% and you distill it up to say 80% alcohol, you'll end up with 16 liters of alcohol and four liters of water left. That's why it's 80% alcohol. If you do the same thing to an 8% rye 100 liters of eight percent rye well if you distill it to 80 percent you'll have 10 liters of alcohol eight of which are are uh, is is you have 10 liters of substance 10 liters of of whiskey eight liters of that are are alcohol that's why it's 80 percent so you can see how it's like well wait a second if you combine those two and you keep it at 80 percent you you have way way less rye than you you know what i mean it's it's like it's, it's wild um and so it makes perfect sense, but just coming from um, uh, sort of our background where we were much more attentive to bourbon and 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 scotch, um, never even dawned on uh, it. 
the only time it ever dawned on me was when I was in Scotland and I would ask them about the importance of grain and they would downplay the importance of grain. And I was always like, but it obviously matters. So why, why are you telling me that it doesn't, that the grain doesn't affect the flavor very much? And what I soon learned was, um, they, in particularly in Scotland, they, they're, they're basically picking the grain that they're using each year. Um, what strain, what strain it is, whether they're using, you know, back in the day, it was golden promise and concerto or whatever the barley, barley strand of the, of the day was, they're actually picking it based on its starch content. Because if you think about it, if you make a, if you make a beer, the, the most expensive cost for these for these folks making um, new distillate is is actually the energy cost of running the still. So whether you have really high starch content or really low starch content, it's the same cost of 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 running the still. And so if you're getting twice as much starch, you're getting twice as much alcohol, right? Like it it affects their bottom line dramatically. To the point where they don't want to pull the flavor lever of grain because if they have a, a crop in a certain year that's yielding a third less starch, then it's going to yield a third less alcohol for exactly the same cost. Um, and that's going to murder them. And so they 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 feel like and and most distilleries feel like, hey, we have plenty of levers to pull to affect the flavor and get it where we want. We have the yeast, we have the temperature, we have the cut points, we have the speed of distillation, we have the wood, we have the, the rickhouse, we have a million things that we can do to affect the flavor. So when it comes to grain, let's just be super efficient from a grain standpoint. And that's why when you go to those distilleries, they, they're always talking about, um, you go to a big distillery and they get to the grain silo and they're talking about how how particular they are about grain. And it's always like, right. well, if there's any must or any of this, like, yeah, yeah, that's important. Don't buy crappy grain that has, <laughs> you know, must or yeast or whatever or fungus. Yeah. Um, but really, one of the big things they're doing is testing the grain for its starch content. And if they know, hey, this grain that we got is not going to be profitable for us to distill they're not going to distill it. They're going to buy the next truckload. Uh, so dirty little secrets in the, in the whiskey industry. The more, you know, folks, <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's Sorry, so fascinating to me. No, no, no. That's so fascinating to me as a reason to completely forego the whiskey making side of things. And move into the whiskey blending area yeah. of it. Yeah. And whether or not you even knew that before you settled on taking taking stock that had already been produced and blending it together and, and creating product. At some point, you had you you discovered that, right? And, <laughs> and and then you made the decision that nah, I'm happy where where I am, right? Yes. And yeah. and, and I, so like it it but what's what's and and this is this is kind of a more like maybe existential question within the the confines of of found north, but like what would it take to like push you into the the next that next step of like actually producing whiskey because because now yeah like now hearing like all of these like especially coming from you in particular like like talking about the the quote-unquote dirty little secrets or talking about you know the the things that could go wrong like and and it's not to say that and i i think i'm i'm wrongfully portraying the the process of blending whiskey as being easy which i'm i'm not trying to by any means but you know there there is that notion though that um it's not the same as having a whole distillery to run totally 
and it's not it's 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 they're they're, they're it's a different part of the process and and i think um you know frankly if i were making bourbon i'd be much more inclined to build a distillery um one of the things that um one of the things my brother says that i've always that, that i always uh, liked is you know if you if you think about the fundamental difference between making canadian whiskey and making bourbon is most of the flavor decisions for a bourbon are made in the first 2 weeks and most of the flavor decisions for making Canadian whiskey are made in the last two weeks. And what he means by that is like, look, when you're making bourbon, some of your biggest levers for flavor control, for, for controlling the flavor are um, the yeast. Um, fermentation is is the most underrated piece of the whole puzzle. Um, but but the strain of yeast you're using and um, the, the, the cut points, the fill strength, and um the barrel decisions be it like char toast level right um and then of course where you put in the rick at, rick house from there you are letting the barrel mature and you know at a certain point when it's hit its peak maturity whether that's four years in or 12 years in or 15 years in or whatever um that whiskey is effectively done now we're starting to appreciate the level of blending that happens at bourbon distilleries we come up with fancy names so that we can avoid the word blend because for some reason blend has become a curse word um but but we say like well it's married with this or it's vatted with this and it's like guys that's just a euphemism for the word blend um but 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 uh so that is important small batch in yeah, micro yeah, batch yeah. Batch, yeah. Oh, batched it yeah. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. That's yeah. What, what What do you mean by batch it? Well, we took we get these it. carols and we, we know combined them mean. with these carols because it makes it taste better. Uh, yeah. 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 But but with Canadian whiskey, the the whole process is oriented differently. Where where they're making um, a slew of different styles of whiskey, and they use all the different grains. Um, they use different distillation techniques. So they do pot still, they do column into pot, they do double distillation in column. Um, they use a wide range of barrel types. They age these whiskeys all separately. And the whole point is to create these layers of flavor um, that fit together for the blender in the blender's vision. Um, and so really like they haven't made decisions as to how this whiskey is going to really taste how any whiskey is going to really taste um now this is this is me simplifying it but until the last couple of weeks most of the decisions haven't been made and then you blend it you create the formula you add it you go through the rest of the production process um but for us what's cool about that is if we're sourcing bourbon from any of the wonderful bourbon distilleries by the way like i always get into this conversation i want to make it very clear that like i love mgp juice yeah i like <laughs> I, I i right like i love i i absolutely love it um so that's not to say this is a bad thing but were i to release mgp whiskey there's not much that i can do with it other than frankly blend it to affect its flavor um blend it maybe proof it like uh, perhaps i could re-rack it and and further mature it but even still within bourbon i'm i'm relatively handcuffed um to to new american oak and so what's what's entertaining and exciting about canadian whiskey is as blenders um we have a lot of control over the flavor so that's why if I were making bourbon, I'd be much more interested in building a, a, a distillery because I want more control over the flavor. Um, with Canadian, we've actually, we've got a lot of control and we found um, more ways to affect the flavor. Um, so the, the, I know the next whiskey you and I are going to jump into is Peregrine. Um, per, Peregrine was an idea that we had really early on that we were super excited about. And um, yes, we kind of at the beginning thinking about how other whiskeys have kind of um, inspired our processes or inspired us to to make the whiskey we th the, in the way that we think about making whiskey. Um, and this harkens back a little bit to our to our days as brand ambassadors of Scotch and and people who 
I've been to, geez, I've been to 75 Scotch distillers at this point. Like I, oh, I am, a, I know I, I, I'm a bit of a nut. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and one of the things that I was always really fascinated about was with single malt, um, you know, the, the pot still is really cool. Um, a very inefficient way of making alcohol, but a little bit more control. Um, and what's, what's really interesting is the speed of the, the, basically the rate of distillation and the cut points you take will really affect the raw spirit that you put into the cask. And in Scotland, they act like Speyside and Isla and Highland and, and these different regions are what dictate to the flavor, which is total bullshit. Um, the regionality means almost nothing to the way that scotch is going to taste. What's really important is the shape of the distillate based on their distillation process, the size, shape, and the still, and then how they match their distillate to their maturation choices. And in Scotland, it's usually either ex bourbon or sherry casks. Now, there's much more nuance within that, and and it it it. It's more, this is a real simplification, but for the most part, big, heavy spirit does very well in Spanish oak sherry casks and a lighter, more fruit driven spirit does really well in ex bourbon casks aged for a long time. Um, and that's the major dichotomy as far as I see it in, in scotch. And what I've always thought was cool about this process is I always thought the best scotch was, um, made by distilleries that were very intentional about, hey, we make this particular style and we know it's going to work exactly for this particular barrel. Um, so for us, taking that into consideration, we said, well, what if we blended and we intentionally use components that haven't seen a lot of new oak? So they haven't had a lot of extraction yet, um, but we intentionally shape the blend with a very specific further maturation regimen in mind. Um, and so Peregrine was the first whiskey that we did with this. And we blended, um, it was 20 year old, 22 year old, 20, it was 20, 22, 23, 24, and 27 year old whiskeys. Um, and and we, we used mostly whiskeys that had seen no new wood. Uh, and we blended them together and then we put them into um, into uh, French limousine oak, new American oak, and cognac barrels. Um, and then we further matured them for a period of time. It, we, we pulled some of them when they're ready. It, they're, it's not like we further matured all of them for exactly the same amount of time. It was, it was all over seven months. Some of it was a year. Um, and we pulled these barrels, and then we blended most of them back together. We actually mixed one of the barrels that just went haywire um and it was everything i hoped it would be um it it worked in a way that um i couldn't have been happier with um and and so the the reality is like even just within this process we're gonna keep making whiskeys in different ways but honestly like i could explore this process that we had for the fucking rest of my life. Um, it is so fun to take mature whiskeys, get them to a, a point where we like them with very particular types of maturation in mind, further mature them and get the opportunity to blend. There's so much control over the flavor where I don't feel the need to start from scratch. That's the longest way to answer your question about like, um, would I ever build a distillery? Maybe. Uh, it's hard not to be. You know, if, if somebody showed up to me with a giant check and said, hey, hire whoever you want, right? Because we're not distillers. So hire whoever you want, you know, blank check, build the distillery anywhere in Canada and, and make the Found North facility from scratch. And this is going to be your 100-year project. Um, that's the other thing about distillation, right? It's such a slow Loop. takes a while it takes a while not just to to get going but to get it right you know it's like sure. every everything has its tweaks and you, you gotta i could i could talk about this forever so for no, now i'm okay. very for now i'm very content with what we're doing um and but there is always the the dream in the back of the mind of like well what if we built a distillery 
So, so why the bird names on these releases too? A couple reasons. I I think um, for us, we, you know, the 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 bottles have the topographical map. Um, we've we've always um, found north that the name everything has been always uh, drawn to this this uh, frontier pioneer hiking mountains um this this feel of what when we talked about what our flavor wanted to be before we even named the company we always said we wanted to be on the edge of the flavor map we we want to be we don't want to be smack dab in the middle um because that's fine but boring um we wanted to be familiar enough where people were like tasting things that they're familiar with that they like but at the same time like stretching what people imagine whiskey should taste like, or at least what Canadian whiskey should taste like. So getting to the edge of the map was always kind of a theme for us. Um, and we always felt like birds uh, with their migratory patterns and their majesty um, sort of fit the ethos of, of, of our um, fit into the ethos, I should say of our company um, in particular, the peregrine, um, uh, per the word peregrine, um, Falco peregrinus or whatever the Latin is actually means like the, the, the wandering pilgrim. Um, and that was such a cool concept for us because we've, we've always just felt like, um, we've always felt like our experience as whiskey makers is, is much more of a, um, much more of sort of a venture into the unknown as opposed to having an exact vision for what it's going to be. It, it's, it's all, I mean, that fits so perfectly with the topographic maps. Yes. And it, it's all yeah. very, it's all very Tolkien in nature for oh, whatever man. reason. Oh, too. that's a huge compliment. I really appreciate I mean, that. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm coming from the guy who has um, Elvish on his forearm as well. So, oh shit! Oh, yeah. that's awesome. I was gonna ask you what that was. Oh, yeah, it's oh, it's uh, right. it's my wife's name and my daughter's name. Um, yeah, <laughs> and then my my next daughter's name will uh, will go underneath it as well. Oh, so yeah. <laughs> so that's really funny. Just total tangent. Um, I I don't have a tattoo. My wife has a couple tattoos. I I've never gotten a tattoo. Not because I'm averse to tattoos, but um because I just haven't ever had the, it's never settled in what I want. Um, yeah. and, uh, my, my aunt, um, we love, we love birds. We love owls. Um, I've always loved owls. I, I think we'll, we've always wanted to do, we, we can't do an owl release. Um, obviously because of Kentucky owl, so oh, we can never yeah, do an don't. owl release. We'll get, we'll get a cease and desist. We'll get sued. Yeah. Um, so owls are kind of out of the game, but we, we love owls and, uh, and uh, um, my aunt is a painter and we we've been we built the nursery and we have um, a space for painting. And she she painted an owl for us um, that we're putting in the nursery as kind of the centerpiece of the nursery. And I That's really awesome. like I really, really want to get it as a tattoo. <laughs> That's so ever. cool, dude. I've been trying to think of like, how do I how do I incorporate having my my baby girl and like. And I love what you've done. That's awesome. That's, yeah. That's, then you, yeah. but then you run it like if it's the painting, then you run into like how much of it and where, yes. and <laughs> like is it going to be on my back or my thigh, and <laughs> the whole like all across your the back, whole back. <laughs> yeah. Ben Affleck style. Like yeah. then if I have four kids, it's going to be a real problem. I'm going to have to get a tattoo on my leg. My other well, kids, legs, daddy, daddy's stomach. real sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then what happens when one of them disowns me 20 years from now? <laughs> uh, well, you may not love me, but I'm always going to love you. I promise. <laughs> 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 I got the scars to prove it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, man. Anyway, <laughs> this is an absolutely exceptional whiskey. I mean, the the care and the detail 
it really, really shines through. I, I, as you were, you were talking to about the, the bird convention of it all. <laughs> I, I made a, I made a little noise or something. I, 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 I expressed myself slightly. I don't know what I said exactly, but I, I just, <laughs> I couldn't help but release something from deep in my soul as i realized that this is really quite good um and i I, this there's something to be said too about that like extra care excuse me that's being taken with even and even like you know older canadian whiskeys sometimes can lack a little bit of character Right, <laughs> audio listeners. Um, Nick made a little grimace of a, of a smile um, too. Yes. Like they 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 just don't all. And it's you know sometimes it's because of the environment that they're in. Sometimes it's because of the aging vessels that they're in. But it's just you know it's just part of it. But you know something about the blank canvas of it all. You know, I I I think that lends itself so 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 honestly to being a product that you really can make into like a bourbon drinkers canadian whiskey right and and did how far into this process did you really realize that i mean was that kind of a day one thing for you all that was a day one thing but the irony of it was we we thought we were going to be a rye company um so we were making we were trying to make rye for we were trying to originally when we first made the the first two batches um which are right over my right shoulder here you can see the the, cool. the, the the cream label if you ever see a cream label again from us um that's that's our rye label um and and when we um when we launched found north we knew that um we knew that there were so many good ryes coming out of Canada that were being labeled as American ryes, even though they were Canadian. Um, mm, mm-hmm. And our um, our uh, uh, thought process was, um, you know, most really serious rye drinkers know that these are from Canada anyway. Um, so why try to? I don't. It's not lie, but but sort of omit the fact that this is Canadian. Um, let's just make lie by rye. omission. <laughs> sure. <laughs> you said it, not me. Uh, no, but, but, but like, why, why, um, why not just be upfront about the fact that it's from Canada, um, but blend it in a style that appeals to us. And, and, you know, we see ourselves as, um, I'll just say it this way. When I go to events, like we, we like to do barrel picks with, I love doing barrel picks with clubs. It's always funny because clubs are like, would you send us samples? And I'm like, no, I'm going to show up. Um, <laughs> I, I love to, to fly out and do, do barrel picks with clubs because I feel such a kinship to people who have taken the time and energy to like gather as a group to just share the experience of whiskey. Um, and it's always fun because, you know, I, I pour our stuff and we do the pick and then invariably I hang out for two hours drinking whatever it is that everybody else is drinking and bringing to the club yeah. and really excited about. Funny enough, I always like the whiskey they bring. Um, <laughs> it's not, you know, it's like I, when, when I think the the most exciting thing for us is we make whiskey that we love um, as drinkers. And it happens that other people <laughs> like, the same shit we like and that's that's really that's really exciting um come so by it honest thing, yeah yeah so the, the funny thing was you know we when it, it was not as much like hey we're going to target the american drinker that wasn't the original thought i, I mean it, we were aware of that but it was it was also just kind of like we're just going to make this we have the freedom to do it so why don't we just make it taste the way that we want it to taste um and that sort of snowballed into we're making it for more of an American consumer. The funny thing was when we made batch two, batch two was supposed to be a rye. Batch two ended up being our first ever sort of corn dominant whiskey. It was 80% corn, 90% rye. The, the follow the whiskey, we made it 
legitimately 70 the the batch two was so cool we had a um we had a, a 17 year rye component that was aged in uh weeded bourbon barrels um and we had a um really lovely 16 year rye component that was aged in scotch casks um and we had a beautiful um 20 year corn component and we blended it to be like 70 30 corn to rye, i mean a uh, rye to corn and we were like damn this is good and then we were like well what if we increase that corn a little bit more and it was like oh that's way better and then we increased it a little more and we were like wow this is amazing and then all of a sudden we were looking at the ratios and we were like yeah except this is 70 percent corn 30 percent rye and we don't even know what we can legally call it um it was bottled in the u.s it's not a canadian rye it's a it, it's it's not a bourbon, obviously. It drank kind of like a bourbon. Um, and when we f- finalized it, and it was 80% corn, 90% rye, 1% malted barley, when we bottled that sucker, we literally were like, no one's going to buy this. We were like, this uncategorizable whiskey, no one's going to buy it. But guess what? 15 times as much bourbon is consumed in this country as rye. So when we made a whiskey that tasted bourbon adjacent and we made a rye, guess which one did better? um batch two batch two people went nuts over batch one people really like but we were like oh shit we should make this again and we made batch three and we made batch four three was a rye four was a corn people went nuts for batch four and we were like shit this is what we make you know it's 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 fun to make rye but this is what we make because this is what people are really excited about this is what and it was even more fun because it was no longer like, hey, we're making rye, American style rye, but it's Canadian whiskey. It was like, no, 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 we're making Canadian whiskey in a way that's actually appealing to um, drinkers of American whiskey. And that was really exciting. So we got one whiskey in the lineup yes. left. It is the yes. Hell Diver. Um, tell me about this one. It's aged uh, or age stated at 15 years, um, 119 proof. Yeah, so this is a blend. This was the same style, the same, not style, I should say, the same process as Peregrine. Um, And we had a vision for this. We actually blended this at the same time that we blended Peregrine, even though we let it age longer. Um, We had a vision for this, which was uh, uh, we were going to, um, we wanted to, when we made Peregrine, we knew Peregrine would have a 20 year age statement. And that has significance and and what we didn't want to do with uh what we call the high altitude collection which is these these bird whiskeys that that have this process of blend recast blend um what we didn't want to do was basically make like peregrine and peregrine's little brother you know what i mean like you know sure yeah 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 Yeah, of course it was we didn't want to make a whiskey where people were like cool this is the this is the thing that you get if you didn't get peregrine you know right um and and so um when we made peregrine and we were using those that french limousine oak and the cognac barrels um we knew it was going to be this really like light lighter style brighter more fruit forward elegant elevated right we wanted that we we literally wanted the um you know how in music when <laughs> okay i don't think i've ever sung on 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 a podcast so hopefully Ooh, this audio go. isn't really go. bad but you, you you know how you know how um songs will match the the musical motif to the words so it'll be like can you take me higher can you take me lower right they'll go like <laughs> high when they say high and low when they say low right yeah. it's like yeah yeah of course they, they sort of match Peregrine is the highest flying fucking bird on the planet, right? Like we wanted the flavors to be these bright, elevated. We wanted the the motif of the whiskey to match the burnt. With Helldiver, we wanted it to be this loon. We wanted it to be this eerie, like yeah. total opposite, right? This this counterpoint. Hell, there was a little bit of a heaven and hell thing that we were going for here. And Helldiver, uh, the the loon is the heaviest bird. Um, it, it, it's literally like, unlike most birds, it doesn't have hollow bones and it's, so it can be basically like a yeah. really efficient, effective swimmer. Um, it, it's an eerie bird. It comes out at night. It has this haunting call. And so we wanted stylistically 
the whiskey to sort of match that. And so what we had in mind was Pedro Jimenez Spanish Oak Sherry Casks. Um, sherry Casks are heavy handed. They, they make deep, rich whiskey. And frankly, you have to make a, you, you need to make a, a spirit that has um, some fat to it. That's got some, yeah. It's got some ass. Um, Man. It, it needs, it needs to have, it junk needs in the have trunk. Some, it needs to have some weight. Um, <laughs> You know, imagine you like, come out with the press release and we're like, we wanted to put out a whiskey with some junk in the trunk. And that's how we, we created Helldiver. <laughs> it's, it's really funny because we, we talk about that when we're making whiskey. We'll, we'll, you know, the funniest thing is when you blend with a team, um, getting your language right, because like tasting notes aren't very useful because right. I might taste cinnamon and you might taste nutmeg. And that's still not very helpful for for getting yeah, the, the exactly. sort of shape of the whiskey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and so early on when we were making whiskey, um, Sammy, who's, a, who's our, our head blender, um, and, and, uh, w- w- you know, the, the sort of my, my, uh, my partner in this process of blending, um, Sammy and I were having a conversation. We are like 20 blends in and we were, we're buzzed <laughs> and we're trying to like describe what this would, I think it was batch four. We were trying to figure out what batch four needed more of. And we we're trying to describe, he was like, he was like, I, it needs more of this or that or whatever. And I was like, what are you talking about? And he goes, it needs a thicker ass. I, like, I, got, it, I got it. I got it. I got it. I actually know exactly what you're talking about. Um, it's really funny. And, and it just, it needed more weight, you know? Um, you just pour so with, you just dump port wine into it and you're yeah, like, does exactly. that work for you? No, you get it. Right. And it was yeah, like, exactly. The, the, so, so this was, um, new wood sherry and cognac. Um, but, but the, the main thing we used were these big, heavy Pedro Jimenez sherry cast. So the, the blend was a blend of 15 year old corn. Um, it was, uh, 18 year rye, 19 year rye, 22 year corn and 23 year corn. So five whiskey blend, um, Again, this thing was aged for a variety of months. Uh, I think as as little as six or seven, and as much as eleven. Um, and uh, and then we we blended. This was the hardest re the reblend of this was the hardest whiskey to blend we've ever done because when you get these big robust flavors, man, they don't like to cooperate with each other. Getting them in line and getting them I balanced believe that. Is, yeah. is just it's just a pain in the ass. But once we had it settled, um, it's just a meaty, he- hefty, delightful whiskey. And, um, yeah. my, the, the sort of the moment where we felt like we were so excited that we had gotten it right was <clears throat> we did a, um, we did a, a, a tasting in New York and, um, we, we had about 35 people in there and we tasted them all on hell diver and we taste them all on peregrine. And then we asked at the end who preferred peregrine, who preferred hell diver and about half the room preferred peregrine and about half the room preferred hell diver. And we were like, we did it. We didn't create like <laughs> peregrine and little brother. We created these two whiskeys that fit this style that we've made, yeah. but can coexist in a way that, that we're really excited about. I'm going to do something that I hope is not sacrilegious. Are you going to combine them? I'm going to try a blend between the both of them. <laughs> I'm going to do the same. I, I, this is, it. it's just, I have to know. I have to know. Happens. I've never done this before. This would be fun. <laughs> what's the, what's that Nardwar quote? We, we have to know. Because you're <laughs> you're found north, we have to know. We have to know. I, I really love that. That could be a new yeah. catchline for us. Yeah. Yeah, hey, we gotta give it a second because the ABVs are quite. Uh, we have Paragon was one twenty six two and Helldiver was one nineteen. Yeah, we'll let him. We'll let him. We'll let him we'll mingle him, for a, for a minute for a and. Minute. That while while we're doing that, I'll I'll ask you too because I I don't think that and and you could correct me if I'm wrong, but Canadian whiskey on its own is not beholden to the same age statement laws. That's right. That 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 bourbon American whiskeys are right, but you all seem to be following the same conventions. Yeah. So I, I've, 
there are there are a couple weird rules in Canada. One is if it's a low enough percentage of a different whiskey, it doesn't it doesn't affect the um, age statement. So like I I think it might be the nine oh nine. I I honestly haven't looked into this because we don't give a rat's ass. We're just sort of following <laughs> we're following the rules that that we think make sense, which is the youngest whiskey in there is the is the age statement. There's right. also weird rules about like so so batch seven is an eighteen year. Um but what's funny about it is um batch seven's the eighteen year whiskey um was eighteen years, eleven months and one week old. Um we could have let it sit for three more weeks and put a nineteen year age statement on it, which yeah. of course uh-huh. is significant. You know, it's you, you can charge five dollars more a bottle if you really want to, you know what I mean? And like you kind of get away with it, which doesn't seem like a lot, but uh, but cumulatively it's you're splitting splitting hairs yeah. and yeah. 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 And um and and I remember having this conversation with my brother. And my, my brother, it's really interesting because my brother loves whiskey but is much more passionate about entrepreneurship. And he's he's my co founder and and um and he's very thoughtful. He's very um he's also obsessive about product um but but he's also much more thoughtful about you know commercial necessities whereas i'm like like, well why don't we just blend an eight year with a bunch of 21 year and he's like are you fucking kidding me what am i gonna sell this for and i'm like you figure that out i'm just gonna make it good it's Um, it's just you know add it up take the just divide in half i mean what are you talking about man i don't know problem he's like you you figure it out yeah, let the accountant um, take care of it. She's not doing anything. I, I remember we had a we were like, yeah, we're gonna bottle this now, and he's like, so I I could call this a nineteen year if you just fucking wait for three weeks. Um, and I was, <laughs> but it's good the way it is. <laughs> exactly, and it was, and and it was also the middle of July, and or maybe it was oh. June, but but we were like the, three weeks still. I, I, we just it could we ruin were, it. I, honestly, we could, and and it's funny because um, uh, we mentioned this. You and I were talking about this off air beforehand, but um, you know, I, I I don't I don't have any. De- I have zero science degrees. Um, all the science <laughs> I've ever learned, I've learned um, secondhand from scientists within the industry, um, and and uh, and so there are a lot of things that I understand scientifically. Um, but then there are a bunch of things that that you know don't make any sense to me scientifically, but they but Absolutely. but I I feel them to be true. Um, <laughs> and, and one of the one of the crazy there there are a couple crazy ones. One one is um, the the um, the the when you're filling bottles. So this is nuts. When you're filling bottles. Um, if you use certain types of bottling lines, um, they'll fill at a sort of at a faster rate. And so you'll get cavitation and you basically get like you're, you're forcing air into the into the whiskey and you're doing it more disruptively at a higher sure, rate. Yeah. Right? So yeah, yeah. and and if you take found north, this has happened 15 different times. Um it's happened with cavitation. It's happened with the pumps. It's happened with um, the micron filter we use. So, like, we don't chill filter it, but when we when you make whiskey, you still run it through a filter so that you don't get charcoal bits in your whiskey, unless you're, you know, the raw cask or whatever. But basically, you, you, you know, you use a, a different filter. We found that there is probably a one percent flavor difference, or maybe a two percent flavor difference, if you can even quantify it, between a five micron filter and a ten micron filter and a twenty five micron filter. Basically, the average person, not even the the average expert, will not be able to tell the difference. Sure, um, sure. <laughs> and yet, we've spent hours blind tasting ourselves on these things and going back and forth on, do we want five micron? Do we of want course. 10 micron? Do we want of to course. use a four head or do we want to use a, uh, an eight head bottling line? Do we want to, are, are we going to, are we going to put a, 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 you know, a gas layer on top of this because we think it's ready now and we have to bottle it on Monday and it's Friday right now, or do we let it get a little bit more air for three days? And what we find is that <laughs> there are these like, one or two percent 
quality gains that you can make 15 different times over the course of the process. Um, we fly out to, so when we blend, I'm blending from samples in my house and we're designing the ratio. And then we're going to our partners and saying, you guys blend in this ratio, you guys blend in this ratio. When we get it, we'll add the thing and we'll blend it. We go to Canada, we have them pull new samples at the different distilleries and we blend with them and match it to what we were making and we'll change the ratio by one. We're so fucking obsessive. You have no <laughs> idea. And so when we had three weeks to, when we had three weeks of, uh, of potentially letting all of the whiskey sit for three weeks, like, that could, could change by like three or four percent. This is a hundred percent not happening. And we loved right. where the whiskey was, and we just said, "Vat it right now, bottle it right now." We don't care. The irony is, with Canadian laws, I believe we could leave it in glass for up to six months and acquire that age. It doesn't have to necessarily be in wood. So if you like, we we could have called it a nineteen year by Canadian laws, and we just didn't. And that's sure. That's the way it works for us. You're so full of uh, honor, and <laughs> we're so honor. Yeah, no, um, no. I think for us, I, I think for us, there's a there's a degree of like, um, I, people spend a lot of fucking money on whiskey. Um, people yes. spend a lot of time on whiskey, um, and. And as somebody who spent a lot of money and a lot of time on whiskey, um, I feel like there's a, there's a, uh, just a human responsibility, uh, to the people who are invested in found North, um, to just be straight with them. Absolutely. Know? Yeah. I can't, I, I commend you for that for sure. Which one did you like better? Hell diver or Peregrine? I think, <sighs> And it's because I typically like darker flavors a little bit more. Yeah. I lean towards the Hell Diver. Oh, baby! But, 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 but we combined them. I, I think <laughs> yes, I did. Com- <laughs> yes, we haven't gotten there yet. But yeah, I think yeah. um, it, on on any given day, I can flip between the Peregrine or the Hell Diver. That being said, though, I'm so curious where Let's the, the Let's blend between the two. Is. The nose is good. It it's it's developed. If ever there were such a thing as like raspberry toffee brittle, that's what it smells like on the nose. Hey man. Okay, it, it doesn't taste half bad. No. Blending's easy, huh? <laughs> <laughs> if blending were easy, everybody would be doing it, Nick. We all we, we all know that. At the end of every uh, at the end of every blending session we do, we'll take all of the little you know we're putting things in little glasses and stuff, and we'll take everything and just dump it all together, and we'll let it sit there for thirty minutes, and then we'll taste it. And it's really funny because ninety five percent of the time it's awful, horrible. Like, yeah, of course. Yeah, 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 it's horrible. But but one out of twenty, we're like, fuck, that's bottleable. Like, <laughs> yeah, no Did anybody catch the ratios? <laughs> Does anybody know what this was? <laughs> hey, that's actually really that's pretty good. I mean, <laughs> that's pretty good. That's pretty good. <laughs> I'm not upset about that at all. Mm. Well, I might come back to that. Uh, Sometime in the near future. I'm not going to yeah, lie. Yeah, but um, Nick, th- this has been uh, a real pleasure, man. Thank you so much for uh, sitting down with me and, and chatting. Um, is there anything that, that you want to touch on before we go that uh, we we might have missed um, that you want to let people know about new releases or projects or anything um, for Found North? Yeah, the big, uh, the, 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 the big thing I would say is like... Um, uh, you know, there's, there's, yeah, there's, there's a couple of things. So the first thing I would say is, um, you know, if you're interested in found North, um, 
and you're not on our, our, our email list, um, you should join it. Um, not, not, not just like a shameless plug for, uh, Oh, I was going to ask you to do shameless plugs too. Right. But but we we're really, um, we're really, really particular about emails we send out. We don't send out a lot of emails. We pretty much only send out emails when we're trying to help people figure out how to get our whiskey. Um, and, and so the, the, we're, we're old school. We're not great at social media. Um, whenever we do a release, we're going through all the things we have to do and we get to the social media aspect of it. And we're like, ah, shit, oh, that's right. Gonna write the uh, post. About that. You know? yeah. <laughs> like, right, right, right. Um, yeah. but, but, uh, more so I think for us just telling our story, it's, it's easier to do it in long form. And so it's, it's better for us from a, from a mailing list standpoint. Um, you can join our mailing list at foundnorthwhiskey.com. Um, you just, you just scroll to the bottom and it says, you know, join. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's that uh, easy. It's that easy. Uh, we'll we'll put a we link do, in the, in the description below as well for people to I add to that, that way. They yeah, can. yeah of we, course, of course. We've unfortunately had to do, a, this is the other thing I want to say, which is, um, we've had the, the really the good fortune of selling out quickly. Um, that's a good thing when you make whiskey, selling out quickly is wonderful. Um, but, 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 uh, there's a part of it that sucks, which is that, um, not everybody gets our whiskey. And, um, sure. for us, like, you know, for us, there's, there's a, there's, uh, people who've been following us for, for th- three years now, since we launched in April of 2021, um, and not being able to get those folks a bottle of our whiskey who were there early, um, because, you know, their internet connection is slow or, yeah. you know, just some bullshit. The email server is Yeah, they weren't queued at the right is. time or yeah. whatever. That, that yeah. actually, that sucks. Um, and and so we've we've gotten into doing a lottery for some of our releases, which which we're experimenting with and, and trying to and, and trying to make more whiskey. Um, but I got to tell you, like we, we've had people who have been following along with my narrative and since Zach and I joined forces in 2016, our narrative, um, for like 10 years and we can't always get them bottles of whiskey. And I, it's like, it absolutely blows. Um, and so, uh, you know, I know some companies will artificially like con- constrict the supply to kind of create this artificial sense of demand. Um, we don't do that at all. Uh, we we're, we're, you asked about funding earlier. We're actually completely self-funded. Um, we did not raise money. It's we crazy. we bet the house legitimately. The house I'm in. We bet the house on Found North. Um, and uh, and so yeah, my wife had to sign that document. That was a fun conversation. <laughs> uh, uh, so we make as much whiskey as well as we can. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, the best way to get your hands on it is actually the mailing list. And, and we will keep trying to do clever things like the lottery. And, and, um, uh, this last one, we did a lottery for hell diver and then everybody who lost the lottery, we actually gave them a chance to buy batch nine to pre-order it. So they didn't get into the whole rigmarole of like, that's awesome. Is my internet working? Um, so we're, we're trying to do things like this and, and, and we think this is, you know, the whiskey is obviously the main part of the product, um, but the whole experience with Found North is is part of the product. And with that said, like we're trying to make that whole experience as good as possible. Um, and so, you know, uh, if you have questions about Found North or you have questions about how we do anything at Found North, um, you can email us at team at foundnorthwhiskey.com you can email us at founders at foundnorthwhiskey.com you can email me at nick at foundnorthwhiskey.com funny thing all of those emails go to me and uh we respond to (laughs) every single email i get the funniest fucking responses when people email team at foundnorthwhiskey.com and i sign it nick and like most people don't recognize them but you know most people don't know who i am and they're just like oh cool thanks nick have a great weekend every once in a while people are like Nick, like the head, like the founder, like Like the the guy guy who owns the company, (laughs) owns the company is responding to my complaint that my shipping is slow. It's like, hell yes, I am. Email me. We will. I'm trying. I'm trying little old lady. I really am. (laughs) (laughs) Nick, man, thank thank you so much too. 
All right, this has been a pleasure, man. Yeah, dude. This has been well, great. I, well, I'm let's do it again sure. when, whenever it's appropriate. You go, hit me oh, up. Oh, yeah. I'll, I'll be For sure. Maybe I'll be once back. you get used to new baby life. Eric, while we wrap up the episode, I want to have uh, you try a couple of these uh, Canadian whiskeys. That, the uh, fact that they call this one Helldiver, fucking amazing. It's fantastic. Holy night! Well, here's here's the thing. Okay. okay sorry. I got no, 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 getting, no, 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 just, just, just give me a, just look. We're going to try both of them side by side. Okay. Which is what, which is what I did. Okay. Um, But what I also did with Nick, as everybody heard, in Tim Bib fashion, so I blended them both together. Well, I try them separate first. No, I want you to try them separate first. I will. Uh, but we got to have high proof hot takes first. Uh, I I know that you you have a high proof hot take. That, I do. It's a quick one. Do you have anything? Um, not really. I you know the other part of my day that I didn't mention was I just had uh, a baby shower yeah. today oh, yeah. uh, for my next kid. And uh, those can either be really, really great or the worst thing ever. Here's my high-proof hot take. Baby showers should be co-ed. And you should make them excessively co-ed. Okay? Okay. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, don't force things to be the most miserable co-ed fashion. Right. You know what I mean? Make them enjoyable. Gotcha. Forever. It doesn't mean it has to be, like, loaded with alcohol. It doesn't mean it has to be, like, you know, whatever. They, they should be co-ed. Right. I agree. The dad had a, a a part in it. The yeah. the 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 father, the sire, the sire. <laughs> that should be co-ed. Oh, I agree. Yeah. Anyway, that's my high proof hot take. Yours, my, on the other hand, my high proof hot take is rental car places because, as we all know, there was a whole freaking crowd strike Microsoft thing. Well, I didn't think it would affect me yep. because I got the I flew into Orlando for vacation before that happened. Well, I reserved a rental van, a minivan for our drive home because we were going to leave Disney, go to Hilton Head and drive on home. Well, my rental got messed up. Yeah. I I believe that. So I got there, and they're like, we don't think we have it, all that. Um, we I needed a minivan because I have three kids, and we had luggage and all this stuff. Yeah. So the people at Enterprise were like, hey, they have a minivan at this spot. Go there. So I had already lifted after my Ohana breakfast, which I was already crying and tearing up because I was leaving Disney. Yep. Lifted to this place. They were got you got to go to this place. Did they provide me a place to go? No. So I had to lift to there. I get there. They're like, oh, yeah, we have one van left. Okay. Well. It's this a Honda is, Odyssey. No, I wish. <laughs> I'm going to get it. We're going to get a Honda Odyssey. No, I had. So before the trip, and th- this is probably my, that my high proof hot take is I didn't research enough. Um. I had my credit card on my Apple Pay scan. Like, I tap everything. I didn't want to take right. extra cards. Did you know that when you get a rental car, they don't accept tap? Did not know that. Yeah, You have to have the physical card. And they said, we can't give you this rental car. You don't have the card with you. I was like, are you kidding me? Like, here's the numbers. Here's everything. Like, my card is just in Kentucky. I scan everything. So you didn't bring any of your... I had my debit card. But not your credit card. But not my credit card because it's all it's all there. Yeah. Like, why do we have this if we can't do this? Um, and so they were like, no, we can't. So I had to go back to the resort. And I had to call every rental car company 
in the area to see who would accept a debit card. And I finally found one after $150 worth of lift fees. Me and April were both on the phone talking. Will you accept the debit card and all that? Finally, they did. And I got a rental car after $150 worth of fees and five hours late getting to Hilton Head than what I expected. Jeez. All because I didn't pack a physical credit card. Because I never in my wildest dreams would have thought that I had to have the physical card. Well, so now, there you go. Now That's you know. a tips and bits for you, too. Yeah. If you go to Enterprise, if you rent a rental car from Enterprise, you have to have the physical card. They do not have a, a tap. What do they do with the, the things now? They would, would they write the numbers down? Because I had all the numbers. I don't know. I don't know. That was the most miserable. I ended my Disney trip on that note. No, this is mine. What? Wait, you're about to drink mine? So you're drinking the Found North Helldiver. This is a 15-year-old Cana Canadian whiskey. That's candy. Yeah. Um, and this one, this guy, candy. This guy is uh, 119 proof. Yes. Uh, the second one is the Peregrine, and it is 126.2 proof. Mm. That is red candy in a bottle. Love it. Love it. Absolutely love it. Um, so, yeah, that's my high-proof hot takes. Um, and my tips and bits. Bring a uh, physical card if you're going to rent a car yeah. at Enterprise. Um, we uh, we talked about this earlier. We both seen Wolver uh, Deadpool, Deadpool and Wolverine. Wolverine. Yeah. We are going to do a full-blown breakdown and talk about some stuff we heard at Comic-Con on next week's pregame chat so yeah. if you want to join in on that conversation send us a message let us know your thoughts on everything um and we will dive into that full spoilers all the stuff let us know what you think um dm instagram anything like that email let us know my tips and bits is watch that and also listen to the new Slim Shady. Um, death of Slim Shady. The death of Slim Shady. Absolute masterpiece. Masterpiece. Love it. It reminded me of when I first uh, listened to the Slim Shady uh, LP. Um, loved it so much. Do that. That's what I got. Deadpool and Wolverine. Fuck. So good. So much fun. Um... <sighs> That's about all I got. That's it. <laughs> I mean, listen to Perry I mean, music. Go to Perry, Perry Ritter music. Yeah. Uh, PerryRitter.bandcamp.com. Uh, newest track is uh, "Cruel." Came out in February. Uh, I think that's about it, though. Uh, you gotta go. I gotta go. Uh, so oh, that twenty years so good. Yeah, it's phenomenal, right? Twenty year over fifteen. Do a quick little uh, blend. Of the two. And uh, while you're doing that, we'll just say real quick, find all of our, <laughs> our plugs uh, in the description mm. below. That includes patreon.com slash my bourbon podcast, all of our social media stuff, uh, our P.O. Box, P.O. Box 22609, Lexington, Kentucky, 40522. Social uh, media. You can follow me at Whisk Mutant. Yeah, that's what I was saying. Social media plugs. You can follow mm. Perry at Peter1792. Uh, bourbonshop.threadless.com. This is my bourbon shop at gmail.com. And uh, we'll see you next week. Until then, though, I'm Perry. I'm Eric. And this is my bourbon podcast. <laughs>